After you state your name, follow the pound sign. The conference. Today over here, hope, uh, hopefully everyone uh, east of the Sioux is uh, having a, a good day as well. I'm going to do a little talk on a fairly simple uh, uh, study. Uh, there's no Clex um, equations in this. It's just just fun looking at cold temperatures. Um, they, it'll suggest a cold pool microscale effect uh, resulting from nocturnal winter season radiational cooling. Uh, specifically, we're focused on um, the area of Watertown, New York, but um, this would apply to many other areas as well. I've got a fun little second title slide here. Um, call it don't walk your dog when it's really cold outside or, or during nocturnal winter season radiational cooling episodes. As, as Jesse finds, and as you're probably well aware, it's really cold near the surface. So if you're a dog, it, it's much colder than where you, when you're, where you are, about five feet higher than your average dog. Um, the town is located um, just east of Lake Ontario. Uh, an area that you can see here. Um, it's, it's, the observation site is by the, the airport uh, on the river. Um, Watertown, the city of Watertown, is actually a little bit further to the east, and it's fairly close to the lake itself. What we were wondering about this case is not that it gets so cold, but why does it get so cold? Um, so we want to see if it fit one of the uh, common studies that uh, would indicate it might be in a bowl. For example, if you look at the Barrens in uh, Pennsylvania, a well-known place that gets quite cold, um, they, they've documented that it's actually in a bit of a, a depression within the ground. Um, a more commonly uh, cited um, um, in, uh, a place in the literature is uh, Peter Sinks in Utah, a well-known place that gets quite cold. Again, it's a bit of a depression in, in the general landscape. A mother located Locations would be, for example, Saranac Lake, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of places in Canada as well. We wanted to test to see if Watertown fit that, that bull hypothesis. Um, we want to figure out if, if that's really occurring, what, how much a micro scale effect could that be? Is the bull um, being um, a, a visible depression in the landscape? Is it a micro scale effect, like maybe only five or ten feet? i.e., does it cool first at the surface right near the ground and then work its way up to about five feet or so where the where the temperature sensor is, or does it have to be a larger scale bowl? Um, once we figured out whether or not there was a bowl, we just wanted to see if we could um, in some of the large forecast errors that the Buffalo office tends to get during these events. So for the study, we looked at 10 different events for the 2010-2011 season. Now, what I'm going to show you here is actually a case that occurred in 2009, one of the cases that, that got us really interested in it. What you can see here, I have it both in Fahrenheit and Celsius. Um, what happens is the temperature cools, as you would expect, at a fairly regular pace through the night hours. And then for this case, again, it was uh, January 14, 2009. Between 6 and 7 a.m., it dropped from minus 8 Fahrenheit to minus 22 Fahrenheit uh, just in one hour. So from a regular cooling rate to a rather dramatic cooling rate uh, occurred just before sunrise. Uh, we had a clear skies all night long, classic uh, radiational cooling event, and fair light winds with fresh no cover. And then right around 7 a.m., the winds actually dropped off to from, from light to calm. That's one example of what got us interested in this case. We're just trying to figure out why does it cool so rapidly, so quickly. Here's a bowl theory. Uh, cold air flows to the bottom of a small depression and then slowly deepens until it reaches the height of the ASOS. Again, this is not necessarily a, a large-scale event, but more of a macro, much scale event. So I have sort of a, a, a little animation as uh, with the black area showing the cold slowly working its way up the bowl and uh, the sounding on the right demonstrating the, the nocturnal inversion really close to the surface. 
did is we had some students run out to the uh, airport uh, with the professor and myself, and we sent up uh, we set up a uh, set of instrumentation next to the ASOS. Um, we put six different temperature sensors at one foot intervals. Um, we used a data logger to keep track of the the data, and then we uh, went ahead and picked it up after each event. Uh, we installed it in a spa-like format um, so that each sensor wasn't going to be right on top of the other. We wanted each one to either have uh, sun exposure or ground exposure, more than uh, getting, getting some ground exposure. And then the height of the sensors worked out to be um, about six feet, uh, just, above, just above the ASOS sensor itself. Example of um, the, the 10 different studies that we had. Um, first, I wanted to make sure that the ASOS was actually working fairly nicely, and uh, sure, of course it is. Uh, on the middle column, you can look either at Fahrenheit on the left or, or Celsius on the right. Um, you see the temperatures match fairly closely with uh, ASOS for uh, several different events that we've got here. So for example, I'll just use the first one as an example. If it was minus 2.8 Fahrenheit on the six-foot sensor, excuse me, minus 2.8 Fahrenheit, it was minus 4 Celsius on the ASOS, fairly close match. Um, so just in the ASOS, the ASOS seemed to be working just fine, and uh, we were happy with that. So we wanted to test to see if there was a bowl. And we did a survey, um, had the students run around, um, gas type stuff, um, um, just checking to see uh, elevation um, next to, at a very, very high detail. Um, um, on the ASOS sensor, and we were not able to find a bowl. And in fact, instead, we found uh, it was a very gentle grade from northeast to southwest. And this point was actually an official uh, land area where they had the runway for the airport. And it was a little bit higher um, than the, than the uh, tower itself for the ASOS. But uh, it wasn't five feet higher, or it wasn't feet high. The study we did is we were measuring snow throughout the event, and we were wondering does the snow contribute to a localized bowl? And we found that actually, when it snowed, it actually uh, smoothed the landscape out, so it's uh, less likely to have a bowl once you had fresh snow cover. The study looking at a bowl, um, we did some fun stuff with GIS. Initially, from a large-scale um, um, standpoint, it looked a little bit promising. You have got the Tug Hill, which is a fairly large landmass off to the uh, um, northeast. Um, then you see uh, uh, down where the star is, that's where the um, ASOS sensor is. And once you start looking at it in a little bit more detail, you can see that there's actually a small hill just between the larger Tug Hill and the ASOS sensor itself, so you can really get a good drainage here because there's there's a there's a barrier in the way. It's very very subtle. You can see a little bit easier if you were to um, uh, flood the area. I called it the Noah's Ark flood or extreme climate change. We we took we took the landmass and just filled it with water and let it slowly drain using ArcGIS. And what you'll see here from um, the, the from left side going and working your way down, um, this will be the whole area is flooded, and then you can see by as you get to uh, uh, point three here, um, you can see the Tug Hill starting to peak out ab ab above the uh, the quote, flood uh, four, five, and six. You can see uh, more land area starting to show up, and then by point eight, you see this little area that's that's peaking out just to the south of the ASOS sensor here. So again, there's a little bit of a landmass jutting out um, that that forces that would pure drainage to to work its way not not toward the lake, but around this and then then past it. Let's look at some data. I've got uh, ten studies here. Um, I'll explain one of these in detail. We'll take this guy down here uh, from the 2nd through the 24th, sorry, 23rd through 24th of January 2010.
2011. And I'll zoom that in so you can see it in better detail just to see what we are looking at. There's a number of different things we're looking at here. On the bottom, you can see our six different sensors starting at one foot and working our way up to six feet. So that's what we're seeing down on the bottom here from um, uh, pictures on the uh, uh, axis and then time is on the x axis. The difference between the one foot and six foot temperature is listed on as this blue line that's on the top. So simply the, the higher the temperature difference between the one foot and six foot uh, sensor, uh, the larger the, the um, that, that's shown uh, with the blue line here. So work our way across from from the evening into the mid hours and then working our way towards morning, you can see the, the inversion starts to develop fairly quickly, and you get up fairly quickly about to about um, 11 degrees difference between one foot and six foot, and then that works its way. Finally, as the sun rises, that 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 pans out, and everything starts to mix uh, with uh, solar heating during the day. So the strongest inversion occurs um, in, during the midnight hours, overnight hours, and then um, you lose that inversion during the day. In this particular example, we got down to uh, minus 30 at one foot, uh, and then there was only minus 20, only quote unquote, minus 20 Fahrenheit at six feet. So once, if you're walking your dog, um, it's where you are. We're assuming you're about six feet high, but if you have a little dog that's only one foot high, it's it's even colder. It's really cold near the surface. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, we point listed here. The lowest dew point in um, um, point in the evening was right here, and then the 24-hour forecast was uh, for this particular event was about minus 29 Fahrenheit, and then uh, we dipped it down to the low minus 30s for our 12-hour forecast. So you can see we did a little bit of an improvement as we got closer and closer to this particular event. So others, uh, as I'll show you, were uh, quite a bit off. What we found out um, was that um, somewhat expected radiation of cooling was the the main mechanism for cooling. Um, you need light and clear sky, dry air, fresh snowpack. And then we figured out that there was a secondary mechanism for the cooling. That was generally going from light winds to a calm wind. When you had that change from just three or four knots to nothing, that's when you had your uh, drop, and that was shown on several of the cases that we looked at. Uh, if you had any wind at all, you would get just a little bit of mixing, and, and, and um, you wouldn't get those strong drops in temperature that I'm showing in this this example here. So let's take a, take a look at some of the forecast uh, events that we had. Um, our forecast is shown on the left. Both in temperature uh, and in um, both in, in, in uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit. Version on the middle column here, and then our forecast error on the right column. Again, Fahrenheit is on the left, Celsius is on the right. And you can see in yellow some of the larger forecast busts. This is only a 12 hour forecast, and some are quite large. Uh, for example, for the 22nd of uh, 2011, January 2011. Uh, at a 25 degree forecast bust. Here's one on the 30th of uh, January 2011. Um, 23 degree forecast bust. In fact, so there were some pretty large errors. You can see on the 22nd we had a pretty large forecast bust, and then we picked, we figured out that we were way under forecast or way over forecasting, and then we we picked it up the next day for a, a real nice classic radiational cooling event. We wanted to see if we could uh, improve that just um, based off of this study alone. And we found, um, first, there, I need to have a little caveat here. Our forecasts um, at the time were on a five kilometer grid, and they really aren't designed to be worked on a point forecast verification system. Watertown's five kilometer grid actually covers the Lake Ontario and the inland area. So there was a bit of a continuity here, depending on where you were how you are forecasting.
forecasting, you know, you're either forecasting really for the lake or for the lake or for the uh, inland area. And so it, almost, it was almost a fourth or choice of whether he was, or he realized it or not, uh, the forecaster might have been forecasting partially for the lake or, or for the inland area. And it took, took a little bit of effort to try and figure that out. We did switch from 5 kilometers to 2.5 kilometers uh, a year or two ago and actually haven't had really too many good cases since 2011 to really see uh, if there was much of an improvement. We expect there is an improvement, though. Um, 2000, uh, early 2012, if you recall, there was it was anomalously warm all year long, and then last year, uh, or the last winter, we didn't have too many really cold events either, so we, we haven't had too many opportunities to see the 2.5-kilometer grid work out. Um, the... So Matt, the professor at uh, University of Buffalo, uh, excuse me, State University, um, put together a simple forecast solution. And what he used was the dew point just prior to the radiational cooling event. And he found that yeah, it had a pretty good fit uh, just following the dew point. The only point of this is there really isn't enough lead time. You essentially have to wait for nightfall for you to get good verification. That's an under 12-hour uh, forecast. So you almost have to forecast the, an accurate dew point in order to, to get an accurate forecast temperature. But it still still stands. Um, similar regression here shows that uh, if you were to forecast a good dew point, you could hence forecast a good temperature, uh, at least within roughly about a 12-hour lead time. So in summary, the first test was to see if the ASOS is performing well. We expected it to do just fine, and sure enough, it did just, 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 and um, we not, or in this case, we do not have a bowl for Watertown. It's more of a classic drainage uh, with a little bit of an interruption as it goes around a small barrier. Um, Columns seem to have a big impact on the rate of cooling. Uh, light northeast flow would be the typical drainage, and, and we're talking three, four knots, but when the winds drop off to zero, that's when the temperature really plummets, classic radiational cooling. And then um, found uh, a small linear regression using the dew point where we were able to get some um, uh, decent results, but your past lead time is under 12 hours, so it's a pretty pretty low uh, window of opportunity. Um, so here are my references. Um, Again, a real simple, kind of, a, kind of a fun study. We didn't have to do a lot of work, um, just uh, just collect data and um, having some fun with some students. Uh, watch uh, the temperature plummet over several events. So um, I'll open up for questions. Hey Dave, this is Mike from Binghamton. And Yeah, just um, one uh, question. I think the, the the transition from north light northeast winds to calm winds does that occur before the temperature drop, or does that occur like you know during the temperature drop? I just wonder if there's any lead time with um, with, or is that just something that's the, the transition to calm winds is kind of a result of the fact that uh, the cold is is in and maybe the light drainage wind is. is draining above the surface or something? I'd have to go review the data again. I don't remember, but I, I think there was about an one hour where the temperature would where it would be calm, and then you'd see the temperature drop very quick, quickly. Um, so I think it was the light wind first, and oh. that that put the temperature drop. But I'd have to I'd have to review the data to look at that. Okay, thanks. It's Dave Sills here in Toronto. Hey, Dave. Nice little talk there. Um, just a question about one of the last things you said, which was um, in calm winds, it uh, changes the rate of cooling. I'm not sure. Is it the rate of cooling that is changing, or is it just that there's the, the lack of mixing that's really having the impact on temperature there? Lack of mixing. Right. I would think it would be the lack of mixing. If I, if I, said, if I said it incorrectly, I apologize. Okay, great. Any other questions?
questions for Dave? Thank you.